politics. I'm Mitch Jezrich. On March 9th and 10th of 1945, the United States, towards the end of World War II, conducted the single most destructive bombing raid in history on the Japanese city of Tokyo, it would be known as Operation Meeting House. It's estimated that over 100,000 people, mostly civilians, were killed. That's roughly the same amount of people who died in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Today we're going to be in conversation about this history of the firebombing of Tokyo. My guest is James M. Scott. James Scott is the author of many books, mostly on military history. His latest is called Black Snow, Curtis LeMay, The Firebombing of Tokyo, and The Road to the Atomic Bomb. James Scott, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Mitch, thanks so much for having me on. It's a real, uh, real treat to join you and your listeners today. This is an important story, and a story, I think, in history is mostly overshadowed, and maybe rightfully so, because of the atomic bomb bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But, but what I didn't realize in preparing for our conversation is that the firebombing of Tokyo, that would happen several months before, we'll get into the timelines and everything, but happened in Tokyo, was, was, was as destructive. Yeah, no, it really was. I mean, if you look at this one raid, you know, using incendiary bombs, you know, and filled with napalm, I mean, at the at the end of this operation, 16 square miles of Tokyo have been completely leveled, uh, burned up, uh, 105,000 men, women and children killed. And it really and it's the first operation of its type. Uh, because up until this point in the war, you know, the United States had really adhered to this policy of high altitude daylight precision bombing and the idea being that um you could pinpoint an enemy nation's sort of achilles heel like the oil industry for example or their infrastructure and bridges and by targeting these select tar um uh, industries and whatnot really collapse their economy in a lot of ways uh and, and of course you know the rubber meets the road when the war begins and 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 america and and britain struggle with that throughout the war in europe and of course, America runs into these same types of problems in the war against Japan. And so that ultimately leads to this switch to firebombing. And the first such operation is the one that's flown on the night of March 9th, 1945. Um, and it's a stunning success as far as destruction is concerned and just levels, you know, really guts the heart of Tokyo. Tell me about the firebombs themselves. Yeah, so the, the firebombs actually are are filled with napalm, which you know, of course, we all know napalm largely from Vietnam and and, and later day later times. But the reality was napalm was actually created during the beginning of World War II. In fact, it was created at Harvard. It was first tested on Independence Day, uh, 1942, on the soccer field there at Harvard, there in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, and so it was. You know, of course, it's a flammable. Um, uh, jellied gasoline and it was packaged into these bombs that were designed so that they would you would drop a big cluster of them they would break apart and then they would they were capable of penetrating through roof tiles or corrugated metal roofs and then they would go inside a, a home the tail would blow out and it would spray this flaming um jellied gasoline on walls furniture floors things like that and so creating the fires from within the structures so they really were just the perfect type of weapon if you're going after dense residential cities like the type japan had so these were time. these were designed to penetrate the roofs and then and exactly then flame yeah. up what after they've done that yeah, and that's what you know. People, look, when you think of Tokyo today, you know, you think of these sort of steel and glass high rises. You know, you think of shows like Tokyo Vice on HBO, and you know, but the world of Tokyo and in, in, in World War II was completely different. You know, it was largely a sea of one and two story wood framed buildings, uh, just rooftop after rooftop. I mean, massive density. I mean, parts of Tokyo literally had one hundred and thirty five thousand people per square mile, and so you know, and of course all their building construction was wood and paper. Uh, they didn't even use nails uh, very, or very seldomly use nails. And so um, if you're looking to set a fire, Tokyo is a kindling pile. And so that's kind of how America looked at it. And this weapon, you know, this new napalm incendiary really was the perfect type of weapon to start these massive fires in a city like Tokyo. Tokyo is one of the largest cities in the world today. It's one of the largest cities in the world in, 19, in 1945 when this happens. Tell me about 
the importance of the the density of Tokyo in the telling of this story? Yeah, absolutely. Tokyo was the third largest city in the world. Uh, it was bested only by London and New York during World War II. Uh, it was a huge city, sprawled across 200 square miles. Um, uh, but the heart of the city, of course, is, you know, sort of its downtown area. And yet Tokyo didn't have sort of zoning like we think of today, where you have your residential areas in one spot and your, your industry in another and your commercial districts elsewhere. It was all really intermixed. And they really depended a lot, too, on on home workshops as part of their industrial output. And so these would be, you know, a you would have sort of a small factory inside a house that would sort of be on the first floor and the family might live above that. Uh, and a lot of these shops had five employees or less. And so, they, and they produced um, parts that were then fed into larger industries. Um, pins, for example, for hand grenades or triggers for rifles, things like that, that would then be sort of absorbed into larger factories and, and or the finished product. And so all of this was kind of intermixed in these residential areas. So, um, the density was 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 along a, a tradition in Tokyo, and you know you would have just the sea of houses, and and without really any parks or fire breaks much. Uh, I mean, Tokyo it was really, uh, I think, barely one one or two percent of the city was set aside for parks. Uh, you had the river that sort of bisected downtown, but in general, it was just an absolute sea of homes and shops and businesses sort of all piled in, and so. The challenge too, of course, is you know when a fire starts, and if you don't have those fire breaks, there's nothing to stop the spread of those blazes, and so it just engulfs block after block, mile after mile of the city. You traveled to Tokyo and you you interviewed survivors of this mm -hmm. event. Tell tell me about that. Yeah, I did, and you know because I think so often you know and it. it when this story has been touched on by in, by previous historians, they really look at it through the lens of the American experience, and, and and that's important, of course. But we live, you know, look, eighty years have passed now. It's 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 important to give sort of that three hundred and sixty degree perspective of what this operation was like. And so I was really fortunate that there are still a number of survivors of this um, fire raid. Uh, that still uh, live in, in Tokyo are willing to talk to historians and whatnot. In fact, there's actually a museum in Tokyo, a private museum dedicated to this operation. And they have, you know, on display there spent incendiary casings. They have, you know, artifacts, uh, coins that have fused together, things like that. And so a lot of these um, survivors actually give lectures there to school kids and groups like that. And so they were really helpful to me. And because I really wanted to know what was it like inside this firestorm? And because, you know, and that's kind of important to talk about a little bit is when a fire like this takes hold and it grows to the level and the intensity that it did in order to do this much damage, it essentially becomes a storm, its own weather system. Because what happens is as the fires grow, all that hot air is escaping. And it's it's it literally going up and it's battering the bombers. I mean, these thermal updrafts are literally battering the uh, airplanes in the skies overhead. They they saw but this when the bombers returned. They they had had absolutely yeah. I mean, the bombers came it. back and the bottoms of them you know were covered in soot and the and the paint had bubbled on them. And so what happens though is nature sort of hates this vacuum. So as this hot air is escaping, it starts pulling in colder air and oxygenated air from the perimeters of the blaze. And of course those those air, that air as it's rushing toward the center of the fire can literally travel it up to hurricane force speeds. So, I mean, you're looking at 70, 80 miles an hour, strong enough to topple trees, utility poles, literally pull infants out of the arms of their mothers. And so this, this weather system of heat and fire just, and in the case of Tokyo, it just, it literally blew leeward all the way across the city. So it became almost like a tidal wave of fire that just sort of rolled across the city. And so when I was interviewing these survivors, I really wanted to know, like, what was it like inside that storm? And one of the things everybody talked about to, was how loud it was and how mm -hmm. bright it was. Because you have to remember, by the time the American bombers reached Tokyo, it's a little after midnight. And yet for people on the ground, it was as bright as daylight. I mean, so much fire everywhere. And it was so incredibly loud. I mean, as the fires are feasting on the buildings and the the, the cars and the furniture, it, it's like it's like a freight train 
is what people said. And so, you know, here you are trying to escape through this and there's this noise, there's this, there's this bright light, there's, there's this pandemonium. And of course the fires throughout this thing, the temperatures vary all over the place. I mean, you've got areas where the temperature literally reaches 2,800 degrees. And we know that because we found a spot after, after the war was over, American investigators did, where concrete had begun to melt. And concrete doesn't break down until it reaches about 2,800 degrees. And so for residents, you know, their, their, their clothing would spontaneously burst on fire, you know, burst into flames. Their hair would catch on fire. Spontaneously. Uh, just spontaneously. I mean, just there's so much heat and there's this sparks are raining down and embers are raining down that people were actually, Japan used these firefighting cisterns uh, and they were everywhere. And people would de- you know, take air raid helmets and they would douse themselves with water and it would dry them inst- instantaneously. And so many of these residents who were caught outside in the this, in this storm ultimately burned to death. A lot of other residents sought shelter inside the handful of concrete structures like schools, train stations, government buildings, things like that. And these did initially provide safety. But what happened eventually is the window glass began to melt and the sparks penetrated inside and the same type of occurrence that happened outside takes place there. Clothing, hair begins to ignite. And now these corridors and stairwells function like chimneys, just funneling the superheated air and toxic gases um, throughout. And so it really... uh, even though, you know, initially these structures provided some sense of safety, but in the end, people largely all perished inside as well. So it's really just a pretty horrific story of what it's like on the ground. You really piqued my interest when you talked about how loud it was. And Mm -hmm. I was just trying to imagine that. And I imagine it's impossible to imagine that, but I was thinking about sort of the gentle roar we get from any fire. When you have a fire in a fireplace, you hear a gentle roar there. Well, maybe multiply that by that little fire in a fireplace by, by 16 square miles. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it really is. And, and that's the thing, you know, when you're trying to recreate history for readers today to understand it, I mean, you want to be able to, to show them what it was like. And of course that has to touch on all your senses. You know, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? You know, what does it feel like? And of course, you know, uh, and, and the sound though was that, that iconic thing that everybody talked about. Um, and of course, you know, on top of that, it was just this, this crazy struggle to be able to breathe when it's that hot. You know, if you've ever been in a sauna and it's really, really hot and you find that you're taking these shallow breaths as a result of it, that's what it was like. And the air that you are breathing, of course, is filled with chemicals because the, the uh, it's filled with the solvents that people keep in their homes or their, their, these workshops are beginning to burn, you know stockpiles of coal are catching on fire. The roads are liquefying. So the asphalt is, is it's, you know, it's releasing these gases. And of course, then there's also that smell of flesh. And that was something that everybody talked about. Even the American mm-hmm. bombers who are in the skies overhead, you know, as they're flying in at about 5,000 feet, these, this, this smoke is coming up through the bomb bay doors so that even they can smell what it's like on the ground there. And of course, you know, mixed in with all that sort of, fire and chemical smell, you, you get that scent of dogs and horses and even people that are being barbecued, literally. It's a huge furnace, yeah. A yeah. hellish oven. Yeah, I mean, it really, and what eventually happens, of course, is it burns everything. I mean, there's just, it, the only reason the fire is put out, it's not because the Tokyo Fire Department, which was completely ineffective and a blaze this size, it's because they literally run out of fuel. So six hours later, it's just a sea of ash. You know, and the only thing that's still standing are a handful of sort of brick chimneys that mark bathhouses or factories or whatnot. And, and a few concrete facades of those few you know buildings like schools and train stations. But otherwise, it's just an empty landscape of just, you know, ash. Is that because of the chemicals themselves that are associated with these firebombs? No, no. I mean, it literally, it's just because so much of Japan, literally 98% of Tokyo was made out of wood and paper. And yeah. so when you have a fire of that intensity, and of course, it's going to just absolutely destroy all of that. So all that's left is the, you know, the handful of sort of stonework. And, and, and there wasn't much of it. And so in, in the stonework that existed was chimneys. And like I said, a few of those concrete buildings that had been, you know, more, more recent buildings designed for municipal uses and schools and things like that. Otherwise, just vast emptiness 
Again, you interviewed survivors, so there were survivors. Do, do we know yes. a percentage of how, how, you know, roughly a percentage of how many people who were in this these 16 square miles survived? And, and how, how did the people who did survive make it through? Yeah, and I'll tell you, and that, that, that's a great question. That's one of those I've, I really tried to answer. And I, I, my best answer to that is it's really luck in a lot of ways, whether you survived or not, because most of those people who survived were on the fringes of the area. And so they were able to get out of the way of this sort of vast moving fire and sort of escape that way. Um, survival for others and some came down really to physiology. I mean, there was one guy, for example, who was inside a bathroom in a school with 30 other people, and they were literally taking the water from the toilet tank and, and dousing themselves with it until all the oxygen is sort of depleted and everybody passes out. And the next morning, he's one of the only ones who wakes up. Everybody else succumbs, but yet he woke up. So his own physiology helped him. Uh, one survivor I interviewed, she was a child at the time. She was about six, seven years old, and she was caught. What happened, too, is a lot of times – both sides of the street are burning. People would huddle in the middle of the street as far away from the blaze as you could, but you're kind of surrounded by it. And so they would, survivors would group together in the center of a road. And so she was there and her father kind of crouched on top of her to protect her and other people surrounded them and sort of piled on top. So you can imagine sort of this pile of about a dozen or so people. And the next morning, her father pulls her out from underneath this pile after he kind of wriggles himself out. And they're the only two people that survived. Everybody else in that entire pile was scorched, but yet they had survived because they had been blanketed by all these other victims. And so it's those kinds of stories uh, so, of who survives. And again, it really, it comes down to luck and it comes down to your own personal physiology because I mean, everywhere was burning the canals, people jumped inside swimming pools, for example, to try and, uh, you know, get away from the fires. But, you know, the heat was so much that the water often evaporated. Uh, they jumped inside the Sumida River. And, of course, you know, when you the, – the rise of carbon monoxide, people would pass out and drown. And so you have cases where sometimes victims were completely burned and then other cases where they literally – they look like they're sleeping. It's just about, did they die from carbon monoxide poisoning? Did they die from toxic gases? Or did they die directly from the flames? So it really uh, was just a uh, pretty, uh, all the way around, an awful experience, I think, to be stuck in that situation. The six-year-old girl who survived, who you interviewed, obviously, as a much older woman now, has this been a major part of her life? I mean, obviously it is. I, 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 how could it not be? But is this something that she is sort of constant she's one of the people that give lectures is, is absolutely that she yeah has? she does Tell me and, about and, her. And that's, yeah exactly i mean her name is um haryo wada and her, her married name is nihei but she is um went on to become a librarian and you know give back that way and and uh so and she gives lectures uh i spent an entire day with her and went to dinner with her i mean just an absolutely wonderful woman um and her story is just incredible i mean I, I literally was just stunned to hear it all and and really thankful she allowed me to include it in this book to help illustrate what it was like um and you know that's the reality the one thing that people don't realize i mean these fire attacks this wasn't just tokyo i mean of course you know, the united states goes on to burn other cities it, it had a, it, a huge effect on the social fabric of japan and one of the big ways is that about one hundred and twenty thousand children were orphaned as a result of that. And so a number of the folks I interviewed lost their families. And, um, you know, because what had happened is mm. Japan evacuated children between the ages of third grade through sixth grade outside of the city. And so they sent them to go live in temples and schools and things like that. And so you have a lot of cases where children were outside of the city and their families were killed. And, and in, in the wake of World War II, there was no real great social you know, safety net to help people. And, uh, and the whole country had, you know, had suffered through this war and was, you know, there's a lack of food and resources and whatnot. And so it fell to families to take, you know, aunts and uncles or grandparents to take in these children. And, and that was a real challenge. And some of the people I interviewed had really terrible experiences because of that, because they're just, the resources weren't there and families at times were resentful of having to help raise you know, extended family members. And so it really was a, uh, so, I mean, that's kind of one of the, um, the, the stories that I think has not gotten the attention until now. It's just, you know, what it was like for these 120,000 orphaned children. 
and, um, you know, as a result of the war. Again, at the beginning, we were talking about how the atomic bombings and, and part of your book is how this actually would help lead to the uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with a nuclear weapon. Um, and those are major stories. I don't mean to diminish those, but they do have here in the United States overshadowed what happened with the firebombing in Tokyo. D did you find that same dynamic in Japan or how, how does Japan remember? Oh, I think you're event? absolutely right about that. I think it, it, it 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 totally overshadows, uh, you know, this and they knew uh, Curtis LeMay and, and his his aides knew that the atomic bomb was going to overshadow all the work that they had done um, all the way back in 1945. In fact, LeMay went on to say, you know, he really it, it was against the use of the atomic bomb only so, so much as he felt that the heavy lifting had already been done. You know, he had burned 64 Japanese cities. Uh, the only reason Hiroshima still existed as a target was because LeMay had been previously ordered to hold a few larger cities back so that we would have an accurate test case for the power of the atomic bomb. Because by the time August rolls around, LeMay has burned through, you know, not just Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and all Japan's major cities. He's burned many of Japan's secondary cities, and he's now really into sort of tertiary cities, cities with a population of 35,000 people and, and, you know, virtually no industrial importance, whatnot. I mean, there's just he's, he's out of targets. And so by the time the atomic bomb comes around, I mean, it's 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 a weapon really to be used simply to see what it can do. Uh, and at least that's how LeMay views it. Um, it does have a big political effect on the, the emperor. In fact, when you look at his. Um, speech to the Japanese people on August 15th when he announces that Japan's going to surrender, he blames the atomic bomb. So it does have a political effect there in, 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 in Japan. But for LeMay's perspective, all the heavy lifting was really done. And of course, this novel new weapon completely overshadows the, the um, firebombing attacks. So, I mean, when you talk to people today, they are, you know, everyone knows Hiroshima. I mean, it's, it's like Dresden. It's one of those cities that it's just... It, it, it evokes images and thoughts and opinions and whatnot, but you say Tokyo and they have no idea about it. It's largely the same in, in Japan as well. I mean, you've got, if you go to Hiroshima or Nagasaki, they've got these great museums. I mean, the, the museum in Hiroshima is world-class. I mean, it's, and then you go to Tokyo and there's a private museum. A private one that you mentioned. Yeah. It yeah, opened up just, you know, 20 years ago that had to be paid for with private funds and it's a small museum, you know, kind of shoehorned in a, residential area and it's, it's nothing like what you find in Hiroshima with the big motor coaches outside and the streams of tourists and all of that so yeah this is letters on politics and we are in conversation with James M Scott he is the author of a number of books including the latest that we are in conversation about it's called Black Snow Curtis LeMay the firebombing of Tokyo and the road to the atomic bomb before we get into the decision making that's happening in the United States concerning this firebombing of Tokyo, have have fire bombings occurred before? Uh, yeah, throughout Europe, absolutely. And so, and what had happened is, you know, America and England had both started the war in Europe against Germany with the idea of, of high altitude daylight precision bombing. You know, this theory that had been developed during the interwar period. Uh, that was a more humane, if, if that's really the right word, way to say of attacking an enemy, which is targeting their industry, crippling their economy and bringing them to their knees before you have to reach a point of just totally destroying cities. Now, the challenge with that, of course, it's a great theory, but when the rubber meets the road and the war breaks out, you realize that, hey, the German economy is far more resourceful than people thought. They're able to disperse their industries. They're able to take you know, goods and raw materials from occupied countries throughout Europe. And, and this idea that you're just going to come in and sort of knock out a few things and the war is going to be over just isn't true. And so, the, you know, one year rolls into two years into three years and it just goes on and on. And so the British by 1942 make the decision that they're going to switch from precision bombing to firebombing cities. And part of that also has to do with the fact that the German Air Force is really a force to be reckoned with in attacking their bombers. And so they were shooting down so many of their bombers that firebombing cities and going in at night um, just worked a lot better. Now, the Americans don't go that route. The Americans very much adhere throughout the war in Europe to the idea of high altitude daylight precision bombing. And, um, and so it's not until 
we move into the war in the Pacific, of course, and that takes place much, much later. So you got to remember everybody, you know, Europe's been going on since, you know, throughout, you know, 42, 43, 44 for Americans, but the air war against the Japanese homeland does not start until 1944. And it's because it takes America all that time to gain back this territory across the Pacific to finally get us within range of the Japanese homeland. And that's when we take the Mariana Islands, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. Which were previously under the Japanese Empire? Exactly. And so, in fact, the Japanese had taken Guam from us at the beginning of the war, and we had to fight our way all the way back across the Pacific to take it back. And so we we finally get, in, 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 in summer of 44, we get the islands back. Those islands are 1,500 miles south of Tokyo. And they, and of course, throughout the war, we've now developed a, a, the B-29 Super Fortress, which is this long-range, massive bomber that's capable of bridging that distance. And so by the by November of 44, we then open the air war against Japan. And uh, we've got a new bomber. We've got, you know, these new islands that we've taken back that are within range. And so the air war then finally begins. And uh, and on top of all the struggles that we encountered throughout Europe, we run into unique struggles against Japan as well that we hadn't anticipated. That includes really cloudy weather all the time. It's an island nation, you know, and so some months you have three days of visibility. And if you're trying to use precision bombing and you can't see your target, it's not going to work. And then also there are heavy jet streams high up above Japan that blow at 200 miles an hour and completely wreck bombing accuracy. Excuse me. So, um, so, you know, on top of all that, so it, it, it very quickly, here we are in 44, opening up this new air war, all these challenges, you know, Japan's weather, Japan's jet streams, these great distances, a new bomber that has some, you know, mechanical glitches and engine fires. And of course, at this point, the American patience is running out. You know, the war has been going on for years. You know, it's uh, people are tired of sending their their husbands and their sons off to war. And, and, and you know, and we're spending vast amounts of money. And so the idea is how can we hurry up and bring Japan to its knees and end this war? And at the same time, do it in such a way that we don't have to have a, an incredibly bloody invasion. Um, and we'd seen that on places like Tarawa. We saw it in downtown Manila, and we would see it again um, on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And that was what the hope was. If we can break Japan by bombing, then, hey, we can avoid hundreds of thousands of casualties by sloshing ashore and battling inside Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka. The war in Japan itself, not with Japan, but in Japan itself, is an aerial war. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, and that's the hope is, you know, like, hey, we, if we can use if we can bomb them into to surrender and not have to storm their beaches, we will save thousands and thousands of American lives. Strategy that's been used ever since. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But in November of 1944, until this firebombing of Tokyo that begins on March 9th, 1945, up to that point, there is a resistance from doing such an act and trying to stay with high altitude precision bombing tell me about and who was general haywood hansel jr absolutely so general hansel was one of america's air war architects he was a product of the air corps tactical school which was really the incubator for the idea of high altitude daylight precision bombing during that interwar period between World War One and World War Two. You got to remember, really, a lot of this idea, this strategy, really grows out of the awful experience that infantrymen had during World War One. Okay, you know, when forces bogged down for years in trenches filled with mud and rats, and it was just this horrific experience. And the airplane offered them that opportunity to leapfrog over trenches and turn an enemy nation into a battlefield. And Hansel was a big proponent of that. And he was one of the ones that believed wholeheartedly in precision bombing and the ability to cripple an enemy nation through strategic bombing of key industries. And so he had um, helped develop that strategy. He had served in the European theater, and then he was brought over to be the principal architect of the air war against Japan. And so he comes in with this mindset that his theory of precision bombing will work. Uh, and of course, he runs immediately into a lot of the problems we were just discussing. You know, terrible cloud cover, awful jet streams, 
primitive bases on islands we've just retaken. Um, you know, brand new bomber that is a sophisticated bomber, but has a lot of kinks that have to be worked out and engine fires. And of course, these missions themselves are really, really grueling. They're long. I mean, it's 1,500 miles one way to Tokyo. I mean, you could take off from England, fly all the way to Berlin and back. And it, and it, it was, and that's just one way to Tokyo. So, I mean, these air crews, the stress placed on these air crews is tremendous. So all these problems just sort of build up on Hansel. And of course, the pressure at that point on him to hurry up and end the war is tremendous. And he's given a very short uh, period of time to try and make it work. And, and he can't do it. And so he flies his first operation in, on November 24th, 1944. And he's fired in early January of 45. He's fired. He, so he fired, doesn't quit. Yeah. He, he's, he's fired. He's fired, yeah. And, by who? And was, by, he's fired by, um, by General Hap Arnold, who's head of the Army Air Forces. <clears throat> and Arnold, of course, is... You know, he is sort of America's top airman and he is a he learned how to fly from Orville and Wilbur Wright, you know, shortly after the turn of the century. And and he has sort of been a pioneer of aviation all the way up to the point of leading this massive global strike force. And he really wants this air war uh, to demonstrate the power of his air force because he thinks it's time that that America divorced the air force from the army and have a separate Uh, air service. And so he, in order to do that, he needs the air service to own a share of victory alongside the army and the Navy. And so he really places um, the war in in the Pacific is, is sort of the premium for demonstrating that. And, um, and he puts all this pressure on Hansel and, uh, and of course, Arnold is feeling all this pressure as well. I mean, he's had three heart attacks, you know, before the first operation to bomb Japan even takes place. I mean, he's under all this stress himself. And so, he gives Hansel a very short period of time. Hansel is proves unable to be able to bomb Japan out of the war, you know, to even really hit many of his targets, and he fires him. He brings in Curtis LeMay. And of course, LeMay is everything Hansel is not. You know, Hansel had been this this thinker, this planner, you know, this this uh, this academic. And LeMay is an operator. You know, he's a combat commander. He has flown missions against the Germans. He has pioneered you know, new tactics in Europe. Uh, he's a problem solver and a pragmatist. And so he comes in and his idea, and initially, to his credit, he tries to make high altitude precision bombing work. He tinkers with it. He drops the altitudes a little bit. He revamps maintenance to keep more bombers in the air. But over the course of the next four, five, six weeks, he comes to realize that it is an unsolvable equation in the air war against Japan. And if he's going to be successful, if he's going to break the Japanese and end the war, He's going to have to have a radical rethinking of how America attacks Japan. And that's what leads him to make the decision to abandon high altitude daylight precision bombing in favor of firebombing Japanese cities. Curtis LeMay is somebody who's still well remembered today, perhaps because of fictional characterizations of him Mm -hmm. in such films as Dr. Strange Love. I, I forget the, the character's name, but it's based on Curtis LeMay. And he's like, at the end of the film, he's like riding a nuclear bomb down, <laughs> like like horseback or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, out of the plate. Uh, there's Catch-22, which was, which was also a, a, a book. Um, tell, me, tell me more about Curtis LeMay. Oh, you know, I, I recently watched War Games with my children. Remember that Matthew Broderick yeah. film? And they've got like a LeMay figure in there as well. So, you know, from his days at Strategic Air Command. Yeah, you know, LeMay is, is um, he's kind of, the, the, the LeMay that we think of today is, is very much like you mentioned. I mean, it's the sort of the, this caricature of him from his latter part of his career, Vietnam, and then his failed uh, effort in politics in the 1960s as well. But the Curtis LeMay during World War II was actually one of America's best combat commanders. I mean, in fact, he he was really young at that time. He was in his 30s. Um, and he's and, and seen that LeMay, way. Yeah, and he very much is. And if you look at his efficiency reports and his personnel file, and uh, I mean, you have people like Jimmy Doolittle, who's, of course, this legendary American aviator saying, you know, Curtis LeMay is one of the best commanders this war has produced. Uh, and you see that from Carl Spots, who goes on to become, you know, one of the top I mean, leads the air war in Europe, top, top uh, airmen there saying the exact same thing. And, and, and they're right because I mean, LeMay, 
he had grown up dirt poor in Ohio. And, you know, his father had been sort of a ne'er-do-well and a dreamer who never amounted to much. And so LeMay had learned at a young age that if he was going to be successful, he could only depend upon himself. I mean, he put himself through Ohio State working all night in a steel mill. I mean, imagine getting off shift at three or four in the morning, trying to grab a couple hours of sleep and then being ready to go to college classes at eight or 9 a.m. I mean, it's just that was the level of of, of effort he put into it. So he's just, he's a really dogged, tireless worker um, who has this just incredible work ethic and depend and, and sense that, you know, if no money's going to, there's going to be no easy way. And so when he goes to war in Europe, he does, he, he starts problem solving there as well. And he realizes that, Hey, you know, we need better formations to protect our B-17s against German fighters. So he helps design these new formations that are ultimately adopted by the 8th Air Force. You know, he uses his artillery training to sort of figure out that German anti-aircraft fire isn't as good as everybody feared it was and that air crews actually could fly longer, straighter bombing runs over targets and get their bombs on target. So he develops this reputation for being this problem solver, which is why he's then brought in to the Pacific to figure out how can we fix the bombing war against Japan. And uh, it's important to remember, I mean, he gave tremendously of himself. You know, he had a young family. He was married and had a young daughter. And he didn't see them for much of the war. He was overseas almost the, the whole war. And if you look at his personal letters home to his family, I mean, he's asking his wife things like, his daughter's name is Janie. He's like, you know, how was Janie's birthday party? You know, what kind of cake did you have? You know, what did you guys do? I mean, he's missing out on all of this stuff because he's overseas fighting. And so I, I really think it's a, and he's often complaining about how little sleep he gets. You know, he says things like, when this war's over, I'm going to sleep forever. <laughs> I mean, it's just, again, he just for year after year, he's just giving tremendously of himself to the war effort. And um, and it's Curtis LeMay who orders the firebombing of Tokyo. Correct. Yeah. yeah. LeMay, like I said, he tries to sort of problem so solve what was going on with high altitude precision bombing, realizes it's not working. And that's when he makes this decision that, you know what, we're going to bring the bombers in from 30,000 feet down to 5,000 feet. We're going to switch them from day to night. And we're going to get rid of conventional weapons, use the incendiaries, and we're just going to burn their cities down. If I recall all of this correctly, and I may get a detail here or two wrong, but filmmaker Errol Morris once asked former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara if he was a war criminal for what happened in the <laughs> Vietnam War. And he didn't answer the question directly, but he said, and he talked about the firebombing, I believe, of Tokyo, and said that if we would have lost that war, the firebombing would have constituted a war crime. I don't know if he said Curtis LeMay himself, but clearly. Yeah, no, he, he attributes that. I mean, LeMay, and LeMay actually said to his aides, you know, if, if we lose this war, we'll be tried as war criminals. That's right. LeMay, LeMay said it himself. So he's, yeah. he, he's quoting LeMay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a, that, that, you know, that he made that comment and, you know, McNamara recalls that. And, um, and it's, you know, that's, you know, but so, they so were the may to... recognize this could, potentially could be a war crime. Yeah. And, you know, LeMay kind of justifies the Tokyo raid uh, in part because of Japan's um, dependence upon these home industries. And, and I think he kind of says, you know, he's like, look, you know, we, we knew we were going to kill a lot of women and children, but it had to be done. And, you know, and I think in Tokyo, where 50 percent of the industrial output comes from these home industries, you know, he can make that argument. Uh, the, it's the, the challenges later in the campaign when he's going after small cities that have virtually no imp industrial importance whatsoever. And even the um, the U.S. Strategic Bomb Survey says, you know, hey, by the latter part of his campaign, it's clear ta the number one thing factor in picking targets was not a city's urban output or industrial output, it's combustibility. And so in that latter part of the campaign, I mean, really, it all comes down to what will burn. And of course, that then that that moves it into the whole terror civilian targeting realm from there. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt is still alive, still president during this period of time. He would die on April 12th, 1945. So he's not alive for the, dro the, the, the dropping of the atomic bombs. 
but but he is alive for 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 this for the firebombing of Tokyo. He's alive for when uh, General Haywood Hansel is fired and replaced by Curtis LeMay. Does FDR play a role in this? Not much of one, no. And at that point, you got to remember, by the time this really takes place, he's pretty sick at this point, and he's kind of checked out on it all. And so, um, you know, he initially, back in 1939, when Germany's um, bombing a lot of the low countries in, in Northern Europe, is you know, he says this type of bombing is it, it's against humanity and whatnot. And so, you know, he's very firm and strong on the record in the early part of the war against civilian um deaths and whatnot but his opinions and, and there's not a there's not a, a a deep roster of opinion and documents sort of showing his evolution of thinking but he does for example green light the manhattan project which is the development of the atomic bomb which is of course a weapon that is never going to be a precision weapon i mean it is purely going to be one of destruction um he is briefed by hap arnold uh in early 1944 about why Japan cities make good targets and he doesn't put his foot down or anything like that. So, um, but largely, you know, the target selection and the, how to prosecute this war really falls to Hap Arnold and the army air forces. And, and that's the thing too, you know, Hap Arnold was really committed. He wanted this independent air force. And in a lot of ways he got it in this in the war against Japan, because he didn't want, he, so he designed in, in, in this mass, massive new bomber, the B-29. It's the most revolutionary aircraft of the war. And he did not want it to be absorbed by Douglas MacArthur and the Army or Chester Nimitz and the Navy and become sort of an auxiliary to these other services. He really saw it as a a weapon, like a solo weapon that could, like a submarine that was designed for an offensive capability. And so instead of allowing it Douglas MacArthur, Chester Nimitz to sort of take control. Arnold goes to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and he says, you know what? We need a new Air Force. We're going to create the 20th Air Force. And I'm going to be the general in charge of it. And I'm going to report directly to you guys, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the 20th Air Force's mission is going to be to break Japan's back. And so what he does then is he's, he can't leave Washington. So he sends Hansel and LeMay out there to do it. And so these guys essentially are running their own strategic air force against japan and so so arnold has you know this this i mean kind of basically builds this independent air force that is under his control out there doing then arnold has this massive heart attack in january of 1945 and he's off convalescing in florida and then you have lemay out there by himself running this thing who you know is reporting to arnold's chief of staff who's a a brigadier general and LeMay outranks him and LeMay makes this decision on his own that, Hey, I'm going to, I'm just going to swap out tactics and I'm not going to tell anybody because I'm it that way. If it fails, I'm the fall guy. And so it's a really a pretty audacious personal decision that LeMay makes to do this. James Scott, you argue that the firebombing would pave the road to the dropping of the atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. How so? Yeah, you know, because all the way up until this moment, you know, the Amer- America had been really public and saying, you know, we we use daylight how to do precision bombing. You know, we were trying to draw a line between us and other nations that were firebombing because it wasn't just the British firebombing the Germans. I mean, the Japanese did the same thing to the Chinese. The Germans did the same thing to the Brits. I mean, but we were trying to draw this line that, hey, we don't do that. Uh, and then suddenly we do. And so, uh, and so what happens is when LeMay does this raid, the, in Washington, people are, are they're paying very close attention to what are the editorial pages saying, what are the newspaper headlines saying, what are the radio broadcasts saying and whatnot. And they're looking for any signs that there's going to be this massive pushback that the American public is going to say, whoa, this is, this is an outrage, you know, can't believe we're doing this. This is not who we are. Uh, and they don't see it. In fact, Time Magazine comes out and says, quote, you know, properly kindled Japanese cities burn like autumn leaves. Properly and kindled. So, yeah. But who's the war secretary actually confides in his diary in, in, in the spring of 1945 that he's stunned there's no pushback. That he really thought that the, the American public would, and yet they don't. And so the lack of that pushback is a green light 
So after Tokyo, LeMay goes on, he burns, you know, he burns 100 square miles out of Japan's six principal industrial cities, you know, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe, you know, burns those out. And then after that, he moves on to the secondary cities. And so at that point, it really, Tokyo in a lot of ways is like a trial balloon for public sentiment. Hmm. And, you know, the public didn't, didn't object. And so the firebombing campaign then gives way to the atomic bombing. Of course, in this period of time, there's the internment of Japanese Americans in this country. We had no such internment for, for German Americans. Um, is is there's been this portrayal for the first half of the 20th century, a menace coming from Japan? You see it in popular culture. Is there's an argument that you know it, racism was behind while why the United States was willing to drop an atomic weapon on Japan rather than say. Germany, what what did you find in, in researching and working on this book? Yeah, well, I mean, the atomic bomb's not ready in time to be used against Germany. I mean, the first successful test of the atomic bomb is you know July sixteenth, nineteen forty five, and uh, and it's put into action in combat just really August six. So the weapon's not ready in time for that. But there's no doubt that that you know, uh, and, and John Dower did a really wonderful book called War Without Mercy that looks at sort of America's views towards the Germans and the Japanese and how the media had portrayed both and, uh, and, and that there were a lot of racial stereotypes being utilized. I mean, the Japanese were being compared to cockroaches, gorillas, mice, things like that. And of course the war department had also done a, 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 a big job of sort of weaponizing the atrocity stories coming out of the Pacific. I mean, it's that the Americans were very aware of the Bataan death March and how awful that was. They knew what had happened uh, in the wake of the Battle of Manila. You know, they knew what happened in um, Nanking. Uh, and so they were, you know, using these things to shape public opinion by and putting them out there. And um, and so they kind of they, they weaponized these atrocity stories for uh, for public opinion purposes. And so, of course, all that kind of plays into the whole lack of pushback, decision making, et cetera. Yeah. Japan. The Japanese Empire certainly is not an empire of, of virtue. It's yeah. responsible for its own massacres, and you indicated it had also uh, conducted firebomb raids in mm -hmm. in China. Um, so when, when you say the, mil the U.S. military had weaponized that information, I mean, what, what, what did the documentation show? Did, did it did it show that we're trying? To, we have a plan to sort of present propaganda. Use this and and. In terms we, of no, we, de we definitely were using it for propaganda purposes. There's no doubt about it. We were putting that information out there. And so, um, you know, in the media and um, serializing stories and things like that. So, I mean, you know, Japan was doing the exact same thing about us, too. I mean, so it's it's kind of kind of part and parcel for it. So um, that the, uh, uh, the governments are going to use these kinds of stories to their to their benefit. And um, but it's again, you know, and these were stories that I mean, the Japanese they're and I've written extensively on how awful Japanese conduct was in the wake of the Doolittle Raid. I mean, when they went through China and burned villages and, uh, you know, they did the same thing in Manila, uh, 100,000 civilians killed during the 29 day battle there. And so, I mean, what they did is they just they put these reports out showing what was going on. And I mean, the truth of the matter is. This is what happened. And also, of course, you can't you also have to remember, I mean, the Americans were still very upset about the attack on Pearl Harbor. I mean, this was a, a stunning blow you know, a few years earlier that um, that still very much resonated with the American public in 1945. James Scott has been our guest again. James M. Scott is the author of the book that we have been in conversation about. It's called Black Snow, Curtis LeMay, The Firebombing of Tokyo and the road to the atomic bomb. We have 30 seconds left, but the significance of the title, Black Snow. Yeah, no, of course, you know, that it's the embers and the, the soot raining down afterwards. It's just sort of that blanketing of the uh, snow. But the Japanese actually called what happened that night, the night of the black snow. And so uh, it was a, a term in use back in the 1945. And so I, I thought it made a, a title, a great title. <laughs> I usually don't ask a, a follow-up question with after the outro, but I'm glad I did there. Yeah. James Scott, thank you. Mitch, thanks so much for having me on.